You may be seated. If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, give me a reading from Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse number 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed in wonder, with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. The man in the crowd answered, Teacher, we brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit. They could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to shake hands with this father <clears throat> because I can identify with him in his doubts. Here's a guy who has the courage to say, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Maybe even more than shake his hand, I'd, I'd like to go and, and put my arm around him. He felt the way that more people feel. <clears throat> the only difference between him and us is that he had the courage to admit the way that he felt. Now, make no mistake about this. The doubt of this man was not an act of what you could call moral perversity. There are many people who, who, who refuse to believe because they would need to change their lifestyle. They look at Jesus and, and they hear the call of Jesus and, and they're honest enough to recognize that if they accept that call, then some things in their life, well, it's going to have to change. And they don't want those things to change. And so they manufacture doubts in order to repel the call of the Lord. That's not the doubt of this first century father. And also this, this man's doubt is not an act of what you could call intellectual arrogance. There are some people who... who um, have higher education degrees or they read on the internet of course you know everything you read on the internet is true <clears throat> and and it's and they it's staggering that well how much they feel that they know these people are arrogant and they're not humble at all these people doubt principally because of conceit. They're not like this father. His doubt is instead a doubt of himself and a doubt of his own doubt and a doubt of Jesus. Can you relate to him? When this man lived... Illness was looked upon as a punishment because of sin. You were sick because you displeased God. And, and you can be sure that every time this father looked at his epileptic son, that's probably what he had. 
at least very close to it. He thought that his son's sin was not, well, it wasn't what caused it. It was his own sin that caused it. Imagine what that was like to see your son throwing himself into fire or throwing himself into water. His little back bent, his, his rib cage distended until it just shook violently. And wiping the foam from his purple lips. And doing all of this and knowing and believing all the time that your son was suffering because of your sin. That was the thought in the heart of this father. And while his son was trying to die only once, he would die a thousand times. Well, now we are spiritually sophisticated enough to understand that illness is not a punishment visited upon us by God. But the doubts that this father had are in the hearts of a lot of people today. And just like that father from the first century, we keep those feelings to ourselves secretly down deep inside. And I know we have these feelings because uh, of an experiment that I used one time, and I know other people have done this as well. Um, you go into an audience and you ask, you ask them to take out a pen and paper. And, and you list, have them list five weaknesses List five weaknesses in your character and your personality. And, and then when you're done, raise your hand. And so they, you have just five things you have to list that are weaknesses. And after about a minute, every hand goes up. Then you reverse the process. And you say, could you please list five strengths in your character? Five things of which you are strongest. And after one minute, no hands. And many times after three or four minutes, not every hand is raised. We are much more sensitive to our weaknesses than our strengths. Because we tend to accentuate the negative. We limit what we can produce in this life. Expectation has an awful lot with how we produce. There was, a, there was a study done a number of years ago out west where they took elementary students and they divided these students into two groups. The students were all average students, but one group was told to be exceptional and another group was told that they were slow learners. And the teachers, that's what the teachers were told. And at the end of the semester, the ones who were told to be exceptional were further ahead than anybody ever expected. And the ones who were told who were slow were far behind, much more so than anybody expected. When the teachers believed that they were able to do it, that is the students, that group moved ahead because expectation has an awful lot to do with end results. And most of us today do not have high expectations about ourselves. I don't experience an answer to every prayer like I'm sure they do. You know, these people who say that they are in so much in touch with God. I don't consider myself a super Christian like so many folks do today. You know, they, they have a direct line to God and I as a result, we doubt ourselves, and, and we begin a slow, slow death inside. Emperor Frederick of the Holy Roman Empire was a very curious man. Uh, in the 13th century, he decided that he wanted to know what the language was spoken in the Garden of Eden. So he concocted this experiment. This is true. He concocted this experiment to determine this. He took a certain uh, amount of babies after they were born, and he isolated them and instructed the nurses taking care of them never to speak a word 
for the babies to hear. Because he's thinking that when the babies start to speak, that's the language that was spoken at the Garden of Eden. He never got any results because every single baby died. And they died because there was in them, as in all of us, a desperate need for communication. And when we don't communicate, when these doubts which we have about ourselves and our fears, when they're locked up down deep inside and we never share them, we, we cry out, please, Lord, forbid that, forbid that anybody should know what's going on inside of me. That's the way this father felt when he looked at his son. And then Jesus stands in front of him and he says, all things are possible with God for those who believe. Do you believe? And what could he say? He said the most that he could say. He said, Lord, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Lord, I'm trying to believe, but my doubts about myself overcome me. Lord, you don't know what I'm like. I don't know if there's anybody else in this world who really loves me because, you see, what people love is, is the shell that I've erected. And I know that that shell really isn't me. And I wonder all the time if they would really, really love me if they knew what I really am. I wonder if anybody here can relate to this man. Staring Jesus in the face, he said, okay, you ask for it. Here's my soul, and it's, it's not very pretty. And he's shaking hands. Well, they're me. And these tears, these tears are me. And this anxiety that I have, that's me. But Jesus, when I look at you, well, I see something in your face that makes me think about God. So here it is, my, my beat up soul, and, and you pick it up. And you'll likely bruise it, and, and if you ignore it, well, I guess it'll just silently slip away. But Jesus, if you would put your soul down beside it and, and we, can, we can love, then maybe he came to the place where he, for the very, very first time, began to doubt his own doubts. Some of the most horrible things that have ever happened in the world were by people who never doubted their own doubts. In the Roman Inquisition, um, <laughs> there, there, are, there are many examples, but they were led by one man. And there were despicable acts of cruelty that were done to people. The man by the name of Ignatius Loyola and he's the man who founded the Jesuits. Now, the Jesuits are a, are a calm group today, but th back then they had 18 rules. 18 rules for the order. Number 13 in that rule was this. To arrive at the truth in all things, we ought to always be ready to believe that what we see as black is, I'm sorry, as white is black, if the church so defines it. Let me say it again. To arrive at the truth in all things, we ought to always be ready to believe that what we see as white is black, if the church so defines it. When you start out like that, you are heading for tragedy. Honesty never has to fear doubt, because when doubt comes, it's been called the growing edge of faith. Socrates meant that when he said that the unexamined life is not worth living. 
There's no shame in doubting your own doubts when you do so to discover truth. That's what happened with his father. He got to the place where he was ready to do that, but he, he couldn't do it until Jesus specifically asked him if he would do it. He couldn't initially do it because not only did he doubt himself and he doubted his doubts, but he doubted Jesus too. Why would this Jesus want to talk to anybody like me? When he sees what happened to my son, he'll turn away. <coughs> Why did the father feel like that about Jesus? It's because he had already met some of Jesus' disciples. He ran into a group that was trying to be like Jesus. They weren't working, so they began fighting with each other. You read about that earlier on in the chapter. That happens a lot. Does that shock you? We aren't supposed to try to be like Jesus. You're supposed to be you. We believe that Jesus is with us, so we don't have to try to be like Jesus. You ever met people who, who say you have to have the same experience that they've had as a follower of Jesus? You ever met people like that? Do you know why folks do that? It's because they're full of doubts themselves. And if they can get you to buy what they're selling, then they can say, ha, I was right. I knew I was right. That's what you have to be like. People come to the Lord in many different ways. I think about my dad. My dad was a strong Christian. He, he was a lay speaker. He sang in the choir. He taught Sunday school. He raised a Christian home with my mom. Strong Christian. He could never point to the time when he accepted Christ. But he did. It was gradual. My wife, Cheryl, could point, pinpoint the exact date and time when she received the Lord. It wasn't gradual. It was, a, it was an exciting event right then. People come to the Lord in many different ways. I remember I went forward at a lay witness mission. I don't remember the date, but I know I, I knelt at the, at the chancel rail and had some person who was a lay person pray over me that I would receive the Lord. I don't remember the date. So there's three different groups right there. People come to the Lord in different ways. What we're really called upon to do is to be ourselves to people. And tell them about our victories. And tell them about our struggles. You can describe Jesus with one word. That word is love. And love never, ever, ever puts you down. So this man, having been put off by his disciples, Jesus' disciples... Stands by Jesus and says, Master, if you can, if, if you would have mercy... And he starts off with, if you can, would Jesus do it? It is too good to be true. I got to thinking about my marriage. I remember how, how um, I didn't really date in college. I had, had a girl, by the way, her name was Cheryl, my freshman year. And we did things together. That's about it. But then there was a friend of mine who, and some of you may have this, he, he would date a different girl every month and didn't tell the girl, but would break up basically after a month. And then he went out with this other girl. Her name was Cheryl. And on study day, which is the day that you are supposed to study for your finals, which start the next day, he broke up with her. What a guy. And so this particular girl came to my dorm and crying because we'd been friends. And we walked around in the snow on study day for about two or three hours. And that got to be a relationship that ended up being a marriage. And I'm thinking to myself, this is just too good to be true. I married way above myself. 
You can say amen to that, and I won't be offended. Because <laughs> most of you guys here, you could say the same thing. And if you don't, we'll talk. How much more, how much more is my life better now because I know Jesus? How could he love me to provide for me so much? That's the way this father felt as he gave as much of himself as he could to as much of Jesus as he could handle. And, and the crowds. That, he said, Lord, I'm, I'm trying to believe. Help me in my unbelieving. And so Jesus, touched by his honesty, he does this most wonderful thing. He healed the son. And he took the little boy's hand and he, and he, and he put it in his dad's hand. And that scene is so intimate that the gospel, that Mark draws a veil across it so that we can't see Jesus and the little boy and the father leave together. You know, you're, you're here this morning not by accident, not by chance, not by coincidence. And this is Jesus' message to you. I love you. Is that okay? Yeah, but Lord, you, you don't know what it's like down inside of me. I don't tell everybody what I think and I do. And, and Jesus says, I love you. Is that okay? Yeah, but you know, I've done things. And I say things, and I go places, and I have thoughts, and I get on things. I, I, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And you don't know what like, I love you. Is that okay? And that's what he says to you. I love you. Is that okay? Would you pray with me? Father, we were not made to keep things to ourselves. We were made to communicate with each other. We are the body of Christ. You call upon us to, to receive your love. Father, we come to this place for many different reasons and many different walks of life. We come with many thoughts in our hearts and, and so often we just chalk it off that we've been to church and that's good enough for us. But you, you want to know where we stand. So as I'm praying, I would ask that you would ask Jesus to be very present in your life. I'm not going to have you raise your hand, not going to have you come forward, not going to have you stand up, but this is between you and Jesus. He knows what you're like. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he says, I love you. Is that okay? Would you ask him to make you okay? And upon making that request, please share that with someone. Your words will encourage someone else. Father, you tell us that, that when we gather together, you're very present with us. 
And so you are here today, and you, you don't want us to doubt anymore. You want us to know you intimately. So we pray that that would be so. So take us from this place, eager to share the good news that you placed in our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next week. Thank you.